This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. It's time for This Week in Virology. This is episode number 292. We're recording on May 8th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Twiv is back on the road today. I'm in Gaithersburg, Maryland. I'm at the biotech company known as Metamune, which we've talked about quite a few times, their products anyway, on Twiv. And this is our first visit within a company. We usually do academic science, but we're gonna see how this goes. We'll see if some of the individuals we've picked say anything. Maybe they can't, who knows, let's see. So I've collected a few people. I'm just kidding, guys. <laughs> I've collected a few people from uh, the company, and uh, they're here on my left, as you can see. And the first, I'm going to read your titles, which I was given, but they may be wrong. So maybe you've been promoted or demoted. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, first on my left is Director of R&D Virology Research in Infectious Diseases, Wade Blair. Welcome. Correct. Thank you. And that's, Glad to be here. That's the right title? That's correct. Great. Roughly. Okay. And next to Wade is Nicole Kyward Lillay, who's a scientist in, also in research and in infectious diseases. Is that right? Also? That's correct. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Nicole. And to Nicole's left, the Associate Director for R&D, Biopharmaceutical Development Purification Process Scientist, Matt Dixon. Yes, that is correct. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to ask you all what those titles mean because <laughs> I have no idea. What to do. I, well, if you it tell keeps me, it's getting longer every year. <laughs> is it? Do you get more money too? No. <laughs> no. Sorry. And finally, all the way on the left, there is a senior scientist in R&D, biopharmaceutical development, analytical biotechnology, sciences, and strategy. Ken Miller, welcome. Thank you. You have the longest title, don't you? Yes. <laughs> I believe so. Actually, there was a regulatory perhaps in there too. So it's oh. actually regulatory sciences and strategy, but All yeah, right. it's, a, it's a mouthful. <laughs> so I want to go through um, what you guys do and what it's like to be here because our listeners are of all uh, stages in their development and they'd love to know what it's like to be here because they know what it's like to work in academia as all of you know. So we're going to give them some cool information. But first, I want each of you to tell me you know, where you grew up, where you're from, and where you were educated. How, what was your path to getting here? And we'll start with you. Oh, wait, wait, before we do that, wait. I want to know, um, um, Metamune, who can tell me the history briefly in like two seconds of Metamune? Who's the best suited here? Ken, Ken. Ken? <laughs> Matt two was seconds? here actually before <laughs> yeah. I started, so maybe it should be him. Yeah, it doesn't have to be uh, long. Okay. Just who, who founded it, when, and... Oh, wow. In 1988, I believe, started out as Molecular Ventures. Okay. And I'm looking actually at Gail Wasserman, who was one of our very first employees, but uh, Wayne Hawkmeyer was the founder. Okay. Uh, many, many years went and passed. Um, I actually joined Metamune in 2004. Uh, in 2007, we were acquired by AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've become part of the AstraZeneca organization. I'm not sure what other, uh, two seconds. That's so what's, <laughs> what should everyone know are your big products? Our, um, probably our largest product, product out on the market is Synergis. It's a uh, treatment for respiratory syncytial virus in premature infants. And then also- That's, that's we, a monoclonal antibody, right? Correct. Okay. And then we also uh, manufacture flu mist, which I know you've talked about on previous podcasts. Flu mist, what I think is the best flu vaccine that you can't get. <laughs> You run out Steve. every season. Columbia runs out. My, all my listeners say, we can't get it. Make more, please, guys. Could you make more? And actually, that's interesting because when we got to talking, uh -huh. we found out that I guess you have a past, you were in Peter Palazzi's yeah. group who was one of the co-founders of Averon, which I believe mm -hmm. Metamune acquired back around 2003, 2004 time frame. Yeah. And so I was a student in Peter Palazzi's lab and one day he gave me these two viruses. He said, yeah, these come from Ann Arbor. They're cold adapted TS. Just play with them. They're never going anywhere. <laughs> Guys, why don't you laugh? That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
they did go somewhere, right? Those are those strains you guys eventually used. All right, so those are the two big products that you have, and I understand many, many more big ones are coming. Yes. Huge, right? Yep. Okay. Blockbusters. Um, and roughly, I mean, this is a, from what I've seen today, you have a cafeteria, a lot of parking spaces, a lot of people work here. Hundreds, thousands, ten thousands? Thousands. Thousands. How many scientists, roughly? Hundreds? Thousands. Thousands. They're all scientists. Yep. Good. Very good. Very different from academics where administrators predominate. <laughs> are, there, are there administrators? I don't mean to offend you. You're great people. You're great people. All right, back to Wade. Where did right. you grow up? So I grew up all over. I was basically from Southern California. Did you went, surf? Yes. Um, went to uh, college at UCLA, biology, bachelor's in biology. Uh, did my graduate work at UC Irvine in Bert Semler's lab working on the coronaviruses. Uh, from there, I moved east to uh, Duke University. Uh, did my postdoc with Brian Cullen in HIV. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went into industry. You gotta talk a little louder, okay? Mm -hmm. Or maybe move that mm -hmm. towards so, my side, because um, your levels are low, Wade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a problem. Uh, heard that, I've heard that before. <laughs> I actually know Wade, because I'm a good friend of Bert Semler's. Yep. And, uh, you, I, I remember your work from years ago. I've, I've met Bert. So you, you, you didn't come here right out of your post. No, here. this is. Uh, I've, I've worked at a number of different companies, uh, uh, starting with Bristol Myers and then Pfizer, Genentech, and then now here. So what, what, when you came out of your postdoc, was it your plan to do industry research? No, I think uh, you know at least when I was in academia or the labs that I that I was in, uh, the focus was really on a path in academia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I kind of fell into a position at Bristol Myers, uh, you know, almost serendipitously. Okay. And then really liked it there. Uh, but I didn't know much about it, industry, uh, when I was in academia. Now you know a lot. Now I know a lot. Maybe more than you Than I like should, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, how did, uh, tell us where you uh, grew up and were educated and so forth. Yeah, so I was uh, born in a town called Kalamazoo, Michigan. Kalamazoo. There really is yeah. a Kalamazoo. Yeah. So. I've been there. Yeah. A lot of people. With have. Pfizer. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> um, so I was born and raised in Kalamazoo, and then I went to undergrad at Michigan State University, um, where I studied microbiology. I, that's where I first discovered microbiology, and I really liked it. Um, I then went to Vanderbilt University to do my PhD. Who did you do that with? Uh, James Crow. So he does a lot of RSV. Now he does a lot of other work as well, but we work with many different respiratory viruses at the time and the um, connection between the human immune response and viruses. So when I was there, I worked with RSV as well as the human immune response, the antibody response to rotavirus. So did a lot of um, in vitro work looking at affinity between human antibodies and viruses. And then, I decided to, uh, for my postdoc, to kind of get more in vivo experience. So I changed and I went to um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and became a Picorna virologist as well. Um, so I worked with Jeff Bergelson and uh, looking at Coxsackie virus and tropism in animals that had been uh, specifically deleted of the Coxsackie nanovirus receptor. And then after that, I was there for a couple of years, and then I heard about this position here at MedImmune, and I was fortunate enough to uh, get this position, and um, I've been here since, so for about five years. So you came out of your postdoc? To out job. of my postdoc directly. But early in your career, had you thought about an industry career? I actually did. So uh, as opposed to a lot of people who were in grad school at the time, I know some people's academic advisors weren't as uh, interested in that pathway, but uh, Dr. Crow, he always was very um, positive about that. I think he had interactions with different companies on scientific advisory boards and was more encouraging about that. And um, I thought that was a good thing to do. I thought it really suited where I wanted to go. I wasn't assured of that, so I wanted to do an academic postdoc just in case. And, and then as I was doing that, I, I really felt that that would be the right place for me. Right. I think the landscape is very different now from, say, when I trained or people earlier. There weren't that many opportunities yeah. in industry, but it's really exploded. And I think it's better for 
students. And I think students training now just automatically think of it as an option. Mm -hmm. It's not an accident anymore. And maybe later on we can talk about what they should be doing to get themselves ready. Yeah. When you were at Vanderbilt, you must have known Terry Darmody, right? I love Terry Darmody. <laughs> yes, everyone yes. does. <laughs> no, he was great. He was, um, their lab was just on the uh, floor right below ours. So we had a very small group that was the pediatric infectious disease people. Although, you know, as graduate students, we were part of the larger department, but we had a small group and Terry's lab was very close to ours. So you guys are both Bacorna virologists at we heart. We are. Right. Stacked to the deck, yeah. I do think. You, yeah. Do you talk a lot about Bacorna viruses? No. Uh, sometimes. We do sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably one of the better viruses to it's yeah. a great virus. There's Get no your start about. on, right? <laughs> Matt, where did you uh, grow up and tell uh, us your education? Well, I, was, I was born in Texas, Houston, Texas, and grew up all over the place. My, my parents are not military. I was we just moved around that. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that gave me a lot of exposure to all over the world, all over the U.S., uh, mostly East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, I went to uh, undergraduate at Virginia Tech, chemical engineering. I was just there. Oh, yeah. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I visited... Uh, Oh, they have a couple of virologists. Podcast is going to be released in a couple of weeks. Hokies, right? That's right, Hokies. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to so so. What's uh, that mean? I, I turn cur turn codes because I uh, I'm going to come back to undergrad. But I went from undergraduate at Virginia Tech to graduate school at University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a bit of a that's a rivalry. It's right? a rivalry. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But the reason I went to UVA backing up um, when I was an undergraduate in chemical engineering, I got a little bit disillusioned about just straight chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. um, most of the um, connections out of our, our department were going towards polymer manufacturing or petroleum manufacturing, and it wasn't something that really kind of piqued my interest. And I got lucky that I got a cooperative education position in a, and we lost her. That's okay. Yeah. We, we uh, uh, in, in a company called Burroughs Welcome, mm -hmm. and it was in a, a group called Experimental Therapy, and they were looking at um, um, inhibitors for integration proteins for HIV. And so I did a lot of work there, um, um, lots of DNA sequencing, uh, enzyme um, production out of um, E. coli purification mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And it definitely sparked my interest of, of that idea of, of, of combining biology and biochemical lab techniques to industrial, right? I've been coming from a chemical engineer mm -hmm. with this idea here. And so at that point on, I started um, filling in my, my undergraduate program with as much biology as I could take, biochemistry, biology. And so when I was looking at graduate schools, I looked for those that were, that were focusing in that area, almost biochemical engineering, even though it didn't really exist then. And so I um, got my um, appointment at uh, University of Virginia, chemical engineering, ultimately got my master's degree and PhD. And my work was in uh, chromatography, very focused on the sort of industrial manufacturing we do here but from a very engineering academic bent of looking at applying magnetic resonance imaging to visualizing what happens inside a chromatography column. So, so all along the way, it's sort of this sort of bio, building this biochemical engineering career, even when it mm -hmm. didn't really exactly exist yet. Did you do a postdoc? I did not do a postdoc. So right after graduating, 19, 1999, uh, mm -hmm. University of Virginia started here in MedImmune. So I've been here now for almost 15 years. Do you think today you could get an industry job without a postdoc? In, in engineering, absolutely. Yeah. Depends, in engineering, it's, it's sort of a normal yeah. path. Yeah, I have many friends from graduate school who went off to mm -hmm. uh, academic uh, pursuits, but um, lots of people who go in government, government consulting, and, 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 and in industry as well from chemical engineering PhD. But, but you think a virologist would have to do Well, I think as a biologist, uh, you tend to, to hire folks with postdoc, yeah. but maybe not so much in chemistry or other... It depends on the company, too. Do, do you, some companies used to have postdocs. They, did they ever have them here? Yes, we, do. we do. We currently Still have an active yeah. postdoc program. Because that's a question we get asked all the time, and of course not knowing inside, we don't know. So here there are postdocs available. Absolutely. Yeah, we actually have a program of about 15 to 20 postdocs currently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any postdocs in the audience? One, two. Yep. The others don't want to raise their hand. Huh? <laughs> okay. Shy. Yeah, and I should also mention, if you're a grad student in virology in Brazil, and yeah, you want to apply for a postdoc, a Brazilian postdoc program. So really? Reach out to us. I have lots of connections in Brazil. I had a. Then we should talk. Uh, I, I was there a couple of years ago. I'm supposed to go back this fall. I had a postdoc in my lab uh, the past year from Brazil and they have great virology there. They're so we really, should talk because we, they're we really have some developing. slots open. Yeah, I know a guy you can contact who okay. has a lot of connections there. Great. Ken, tell us about your uh, background. Uh, let's say I'll start. I, I grew up in western Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh. 
I went to undergraduate up in Cleveland at Case Western Reserve University. I got a Bachelor of Sciences degree there in biochemistry. Uh, after spending four years in hated Cleveland, I moved back to safer territory, moved back to Pittsburgh and uh, went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon University. I was in the biological sciences department. And uh, the, the department in general was, was a mixture of a lot of molecular biology, uh, yeast genetics, Drosophila genetics. The lab that I was in was kind of one of the, uh, we were like one of the outliers in the department. It was a lab that we looked at bioenergetics and energy metabolism and the regulation of it. And I did my doctoral work with Alan Koretsky. Um, primarily, I'm looking on the regulation of creatine kinase metabolism. And one of the things I really gained doing that doctoral work was an appreciation for looking at various technologies to answer specific questions. Um, Alan was really great at that. And I took advantage of transgenic mouse technology doing mouse liver perfusions, and then also NMR spectroscopy to really understand how creatine kinase uh, metabolism was regulated. And from there, I uh, moved to Buffalo. I did a postdoc for just about two years in the Department of Microbiology at the University of Buffalo. Uh, there, I was actually looking at regulation of ATP synthase and trypanosomes. And then I had an opportunity. You know, I was kind of on that pathway of moving through academics and this was in the mid-90s uh, when there was a lot of the uh, uncertainty of NIH funding, which we're kind of now back to that again. Um, and there was an opportunity to uh, do a, a postdoc position at uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb up in Buffalo. They had a dermatology drug discovery group. And I uh, joined them for two years. And it, it was really, it was an interesting change from moving from an academic postdoc into an industry postdoc. And um, from there, I actually then kind of jumped completely. So my path has been kind of a, a long and winding one, I would say. I uh, joined an instrument manufacturer. Uh, at the time, it was Biacore. It was a Swedish-based company that did label-free biosensor uh, technology for looking at molecular interactions. And I worked for them for about eight years doing application science support. We would sell the instruments out to industry and to academics, and we would go out and provide application support, almost consulting work for people having the technology, helping them to design experiments. And throughout that, there were many, I was based out of New Jersey at the time, and a lot of the customers that I had were industry uh, co companies, like Bristol Myers Squibb, Shearing Plow, Merck, everything that's up in New Jersey. And I had an opportunity to come to MedImmune to take what I had learned about uh, Biacor and help in the uh, development group here at MedImmune. Uh, they were looking to really set up a group using label-free binding technology to characterize the uh, products that we manufacture. And I've been here now for about 10 years. Over that time, uh, I've stayed within biofarm development, but I think I've grown uh, throughout that time, I've become more involved in more of a cross analytical and also now more of an interface with the regulatory sciences side of things. When you were in Buffalo, you didn't happen to know Rich Condit, did you? No, I did not, but I remember, uh, I remember hearing that in one of the yes. episodes. I guess Ed, actually Ed Niles, Ed Niles yeah. who you had on, he was in the department when I was there. Yeah, you had enough of the snow. Yes, although it's kind of entertaining living in Maryland, and especially this winter when we, you know, we'd get one or two inches of snow and all the schools would shut down. My wife, who grew up in Syracuse, I, you know, spent many years in the snow belt. We just kind of cringe. It's like Texas, right? You get a half inch of snow and everything shuts down. Right? Yeah. All right. So let's find out what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's start with you, Wade. You have this. T you're director R and D virology research, infectious diseases. What do you? What do you yeah, well, it's do? funny, my kids ask me that question all the time. What do you actually do at work? Um, <laughs> so, you, you yeah. Could so give, you could give us the, the answer. You the give. answer. <laughs> uh, so basically, my job primarily uh, involves, you know, so I'm responsible for the virology programs, at least the research part of it. Um, and so I meet with scientists in the group. Uh, we, we talk about uh, the data, how programs are progressing. We talk about uh, any hurdles we need to get over and, and, and how I can assist in doing that. Um, also sit on a number of teams, project teams, that are, again, pushing programs forward um, and uh, interact with, with, with scientists across functional groups. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, that's basically what I do. 
So you go to a lot of meetings, it sounds like. Um, I never go to meetings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I, I can tell the sarcasm. <laughs> so um, and if I asked you what a typical day was, would be you say you come in and you go to a meeting, then you get a cup of coffee, you go to another meeting. No, I don't drink coffee. You don't drink coffee. Yeah. Tea. <laughs> Whatever no. it is, you, you yeah. go to meetings. Okay. Mountain Dew or Coke or something. <laughs> so how do you, who, who figures out what to work on? Are you part of that, or? Yeah, so, so the other part of my responsibility I'm, I'm responsible for, along with, uh, with other senior leaders, uh, the virology strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so yeah, we have, we have a strategy, and then we try to execute on that. Um, we have programs that fit within that strategy, and, and we try to push those programs forward as fast as we can to deliver medicines to people in need. Do you ever pick up a pipette? <laughs> That's a no. No, no. <laughs> Although I, I have been you in the lab. You have been in the lab. I think twice. Yes. They chase I, you. I saw it one time. Yes. <laughs> no, last I was year. witness. Do they chase you out when you go in the lab? You know, actually, I was called into the lab last time, right? That's true. Because That's the time I saw you. For right. expertise, yeah. actually. You don't miss working at the bench? Uh, yeah, I, I miss it, but, uh, but it, it's just hard to get into the lab. Yeah, of course. I don't do lab work, but I do split the cells three times a week. We have a yeah, spinner. I could, I could do that and for you. I feel it gets I will me take in there. <laughs> and I, I'm still handling, actually Henrietta Lacks, you know, their HeLa mm -hmm. cells, so I, I thank her. And it just gets me there, and then there are people who will talk to me just because I'm in there, you know. I think that's, that's valuable. But I certainly, I understand where you're coming from. Um, Nicole, you have a title of Scientist One Research ID. What do you do? So, um, I am basically in the lab. You um, do lab. You I do do, do lab work. Right. Uh, fortunately, I, I get to do a little bit of both. So I work in the lab, uh, kind of do experiments. I also have the opportunity to lead one of our programs that we have in virology. So I split my time between uh, being in the lab, doing experiments, working with the team of people I have uh, working on this project and uh, helping them go over their data and analyze it and, and help out because we do a lot of things as a team effort, because mm -hmm. uh, we have in vivo stuff going on as well as in vitro. And then um, I have gotten the opportunity to be on more of the, the team effort for the, this project I'm on that works with the clinical uh, colleagues as well as some of the developmental colleagues as well. So I've gotten to learn a little bit more about how the drugs progress along the pipeline. So you're, uh, would it be fair to say that you're a group leader? And you may not use that yeah, term Yeah, but... probably, yeah, a, group, a small group leader. All right. And how, did, how is it decided what your group is working on? Is that entirely your decision, or does it come from other levels of management? Well, I think the, the senior leaders kind of lay out what things we would like to work on. We are also encouraged to come up with new ideas and, and present them and try to vet them out as well. Um, and if that idea gets legs, um, then somebody has to start doing the research on it, getting the reagents together, um, getting the assays up and running, and you kind of start out there and then continue on. And if the project shows promise, then hopefully uh, the leadership will allow you to kind of progress along with that as well. Okay. Yeah. Maybe but, allow is not the right word. Okay, not allow, sorry. <laughs> Get by. Endorse. Yes. Endorse, <laughs> endorse. But do you, do you do experiments yourself ever? Or? I do. You yeah. do? She yeah. Both. Oh, Is yeah. that something you always want to do, or can you see a time when you're not going to be able, like Wade, not have time to do it? I, I, I used to be like that. I think it would drive me crazy to yeah. not be in the lab, um, at least a little bit. I think there, there are times that clearly are more busy than other times mm -hmm. and, and have more um, mm -hmm. interactions that I, I don't have as much time to be in the lab, and I think I get a little itchy. Um, so I like to go in and, and do a few experiments, and especially just to help out. Um, mm -hmm. So just like the science fair, I actually snuck in the experiment yesterday, so that was that made me. But feel I'm good. sure you can see a day where you won't be able to do that any longer. Probably, yeah. You'll but have to accept that, or would you? Would you? Let's say, would you turn down a promotion if it meant leaving the lab? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say I would not turn down a promotion if it meant leaving the lab. And I mean, that's just to be fully honest. Uh, okay. But I think I probably have a few more levels to go before that's, uh, that's my okay. decision to okay. make. So. 
So Matt, what are your responsibilities as uh, someone in biopharmaceutical de development and purification process sciences? Okay, so biopharmaceutical development, we have, um, we're, we're, we're the organization that, that um, manufactures the drugs. Uh -huh. uh, so it develops the processes uh, to provide high quality, um, potent drugs to patients. Uh, so uh, my, my part of that is the purification side. So there, there's a group that focuses on the, the generation of the drugs from cell culture processes. And then we'll take the, those materials, crude, and then um, put them through a series of purification operations in order to provide that, that stable, high quality drug that will be consistent every time. Right? So that's what we do. So I lead a group of about 12 people about half my group does purification development, lots of chromatography and things like that. The other half does viral clearance. So that's sort of the reason I'm kind of here on this panel is um, I lead a very small group of people who support all of MedImmune for viral clearance. And so as because our manufacturing processes are um, primarily um, expressed in mammalian cell culture, it poses a potential risk of virus to patients. So. Um, in addition to, we have many different ways in which we um, ensure that our patients are not going to be exposed to viruses through, um, you know, uh, testing of our cell cell banks that we use to to produce the drugs, you know, raw material uh, facility uh, systems, but also within that sort of uh, set of, of of screens that protect patients from viruses, we also have the purification process because one of the roles of a purification process is to remove impurities. And we can also, um, um, by advantage, also use similar techniques in order to, to um, remove potential viruses that are there. So what we do is we'll do scale down model studies of, um, at a contract lab where we'll, we'll run the processes we intend to run it, we'll spike in model viruses and demonstrate that the viruses can be removed. And through a series of, of different unit operations, we add additional safety and additional safety in order to protect patients from, from potential viruses. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you would not release, say, a vaccine that contained an unintentional virus in it? Is that the goal of the The goal, what you absolutely. Do? So, you know, all of these safety measures are there to, to, yeah. to make sure that unintentional viruses are not going to happen. Because yeah. as you probably know, the rotavirus vaccines a while ago were found to be contaminated with circoviruses from the trypsin, right? Yeah. And that's a very different type of a product. So the products yeah. that, that I'm talking about are, you know, monoclonal antibodies or common in proteins. Yeah. So those, those products, um, we, we have um, purification methodologies that allow us to to isolate and, and potentially remove and activate, filter out I those see, viruses. The type of products you're talking about where, you know, they're large molecular, they're mm -hmm. virus-like or viruses themselves, th uh, these sorts of techniques are, are, are not as often used, right? Yeah. So a lot, there's a lot of characterization and control of, of the manufacturer from, a, from a, the, the mixture of the virus stocks, mm -hmm. make sure that the, the cells or whatever um, expression system you're using are virus free. So we actually discussed this a lot on TWIV and we wondered if a good practice would be to deep sequence all the biologicals used in a process to make sure there's no contamination. Is that reasonable at a process level? Uh, at, at a process level, that would be very challenging. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we do, we do, we have, we here at Metamine, we have an integrated virus safety team where we do monitor and keep track of um, and adapt how we, how we put uh, virus safety in place. Mm. So a, a recent idea that we've imp been implementing is, is testing of in process for, for viruses. And we'll start with those ones that are, that when you look across industry are the high risk ones, the ones that sort of occur, but we can see that sort of evolving as, as, other, as, as, as analytical techniques, I'm gonna bridge to Ken, mm -hmm. um, make it more able for us to, through high, high, high throughput screening, real time get that sort of assessment, we can, we can again put more and more safeguards to, to widen the net and put more safeguards in place to prevent that right. from happening. But you, you start and you just keep adding on to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned before the, the development of a production process. So R&D develops a product, then you, you figure out how to scale and produce it in a pure way. Are you also involved before that step with them making small batches for testing? Absolutely, yeah, um, that, that, that sort of bridge, even, even, even in, the, in the selection of candidate drugs, mm -hmm. um, there, there is a great um, integration of development and research that, um, that we're always looking at um, which, what would be the, the impact, positive or negative, um, from a manufacturing pers perspective on that. Uh, and then the sort of um, 
influencing where we can um, decision making, mm -hmm. but also getting an early head start of, of where the challenges might be so that we can be prepared to address those. Uh, right. You know, again, we want to get the drugs to the patients. Uh, development's never in the way. We're there to help and make sure that it gets, gets to the patients, right? All right. So Ken, tell us what you do. <laughs> okay, so as Matt was just describing, within development, we're, we're, well, development in general is really a bridge, I think, from research, the, really the drug discovery side, to commercial manufacturing. So we kind of sit in the, it's almost like a, a relay race. And so development sits there getting products from research, getting them manufactured for clinical trials, mm -hmm. and then getting those uh, materials then available, ready for commercial manufacturing. But as Matt was describing, the, the development is set up with an upstream process. That's the cell culture guys. Then you have the purification. And then when that material is purified, the formulation sciences comes into play. Those are the three main steps within the process for producing material. Analytical, we kind of uh, are an umbrella over those three groups. We do testing of the material or the drugs throughout that manufacturing mm -hmm. process. And really what we're looking at is that the whole key to everything is really looking at the safety and the, the effectiveness of that material that we'd be putting into clinical trials. And so we will do some analytical testing of the drug itself for release testing, saying that it's good to be released to the clinical to clinics. We also do characterization to get a better understanding of the material that's produced to ensure that the cell culture process is not having an effect on that material, making sure that mm -hmm. the purification process hasn't had some unknown change to the material that's being pro processed, and then also, also the formulation, making sure that that material is stable for a sufficient amount of time. And so analytical within the development organization, analytical really almost is kind of a sub-organization where we have a variety of different functional groups focusing on specific aspects of um, the analytic analytics. So we have groups that are doing chromatography to measure the amounts of aggregate of antibody, looking at fragmentation. Uh, we also have an electrophoresis organization uh, we have the potency group that looks at the activity or the, the, uh, f the function of the, the mm -hmm. drug. Uh, so we're broken up into probably you know, five or six different functional groups. And my, my role within the organization, I sit on what are called CMC teams as an analytical rep. And CMC, it stands for Chemistry, Manufacturing, and Control. And these teams are made up of the different members of development. And then we also are CMC team leader, which I'm up on one of the CMC teams with Matt as our team leader. He goes to what's called a product development team. And that's kind of a cross organizational group made up of clinical folks. And maybe you can explain a little bit more about what they do, Matt. Well, uh, uh, yeah, so PDT's uh, product development teams, that's really where um, the research, the clinical idea, it's, it's really about the clinical programs and making sure we have everything we need from a cross-functional perspective to keep the clinical programs moving right. forward. Right. So tell me a typical day. You listen to This Week in Virology, and then what happens when you get here? <laughs> so a typical day starts early. I usually get up, drive in, and along the way, once a week, I'm usually listening to TWIV, um, or TWIP, or TWIM, or Urban Agriculture. Uh, but when I get here, most of the day is made up um, different meetings, uh, the CMC team, we also, within analytical, like I mentioned, it's made up of functional groups. I'll be talking to the different analytical groups, kind of updating them on timelines for the different purification campaigns that are going on. Um, it's really my job is almost like a project manager in a sense. I'm managing the analytical uh, process uh, for the organizations. So it's really kind of communicating across our organization timelines, letting people know when certain testing is required. We'll get a lot of times calls from the guys in the purification group, and they'll say, we need these samples tested immediately. We need to, you know, we may have had something happen during our purification campaign, and we need to understand what impact that it had on the, the drug. And so I'll alert the groups in the analytical, give them a heads up that they'll be testing, and let them know when they need to have results back. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, sitting down with the other groups within development, 
discussing some of the issues that they're seeing and seeing how analytical maybe can support them, maybe what different characterization methods could help them out to understand what might be happening in their... So is, is every day exciting or there are some is dull there, days? Every day, I would say every day is not definitely exciting. Uh, <laughs> I would say every day is exciting. Some days are really happy, exciting, and some days are frustrating, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. that's fair. But yeah, I, I think there's always, you know, I sit on, right now I'm on four different CMC teams, mm -hmm. and each of them have their own, um, I wouldn't say issues, but they have their own, own uh, situations that we're addressing or topics. And they're all primarily early stage in, in development. We kind of look at early and late stage. Early stage is really, getting into those phase one clinical trials, mm -hmm. and then later stage development is focusing on getting ready for scaling up that process to go to a commercial manufacturing. But the projects that I sit on kind of span the range from, we're just going into getting material manufactured for first in human clinical trials, and then some of the projects I'm sitting on we're gearing up within the next couple of years to start to do commercial manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wade, you said before something that kind of piqued my interest. You said okay. it's all about helping the patients, right? right? So is that truly a a day to day motivator or do you just get into the science and get lost from everything else? Well I think it's it's the overriding motivator. It's why I went into the industry in the first place. Um, but of course, I mean you, you can have your, your mantra but you don't you're not thinking of it twenty four seven, right? So you, you do get lost in the science. Um, but overall you, you why do you drive projects forward? Really, it's to get medicines to patients who need it. And that's, as virologists, that's what we do. I think it's an important message because, you know, we hear, we get lots of feedback on our podcasts. And there's a very big anti-big company sentiment really? out there, yeah. as you probably know. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a, there's a under, just like there's anti-vax and there's a mistrust of science in right. general, there's this idea that companies just exist to make a lot of money and they don't care what they produce. So I think it's important that you guys well, counter that. Yeah, I mean, I think the scientists here, that's what we care about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if I can just jump in. Yeah. During the science fair that we've had the last couple of days here at Metamune, we actually had a patient come in yesterday. He, he's not on a clinical trial that Metamune's sponsoring, mm -hmm. but he is on a um, clinical trial that was for leukemia, or leukemia uh, for CLL. and. We look at opportunities to have patients come in and kind of share their experiences with us because when you hear those stories, it really helps to, I feel re-energized. You know, like you were saying, it's every day, uh, you know, after a while it does start to wear on you a little bit, but when you hear these stories of patients coming in and understanding how important the drugs are that we're manufacturing and producing, how important that is, and it's the, you know, you know the stories we heard yesterday, it was a matter of life and death for people and then, you know, we had uh, someone coming in, one of our uh, clinical collaborators, he came in and talked to us about, you know, how the drugs that we're producing are helping uh, children. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there yesterday and don't usually get too emotional, but by the end of it, you, you know, hearing about these patients and, you know, 14 year old boy who from four months old to 14 had leukemia and because of the medicine that he was on, it extended his life for several years. He ended up unfortunately passing away, but knowing that he was able to have his life extended and knowing, hearing from his family, the, the clinician actually read an email that he had received from this boy's mother, and hearing that, it, it, it really drives it home for us of what this is all about. You know, it's, it's really easy, like you said, and Wade had mentioned, to get lost in the details and the, the minutia of day-to-day -day work, but to hear those kind of stories it, it really it does drive home that what we're doing is affecting people and having a positive impact on them. Yeah, I, I would imagine if you asked the scientists in the industry, the majority of them would say that's why they got into industry. It's really to help patients, ultimately. It's important. The, the public, a lot of the public doesn't have that view, so it's, it's important for us to get it out there and, and assure them. So mm -hmm. do you yeah. feel the same, Nicole? I do. I think, and it's, it's kind of a blessing in both ways because you get to help patients, hopefully, eventually your yeah. work will progress that far, but you also get to do cool science. So it, mm -hmm. it's like a bonus in both ways. Um, it, yeah. Ken, you seem like real focused on the science, but does it go beyond that too for you? 
Matt, sorry. Sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no worries. There's, there's no Ken here. Yes, there is. I'm, I'm here. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What yes. was the question? So you're, you're, from what you've said so far, you're really into the science. It's clear. Oh, Does absolutely. It, but um, the patients you know. also waver in and out of your mind? Well, certainly. So, um, you know, as, as someone who is in the purification department of development, you know, um, you know, you, you, the science, our, our science is, is, is applied science, certainly, mm -hmm. we're engineers, we, we apply science in order to deal with these very complex molecules to, to, to provide um, you know, hopefully clever solutions, efficient solutions for, for how, do we, how do we separate things. And we're very impurity, purity uh, minded, very impurity minded. Yeah. So that, that sort of mindset of yeah. impurity is bad, impurity is, is not good for patients, impurity is not good for stability, is, it's in our DNA. Um, and, and certainly within the, the, that virus function that I talked about, is, that's the sole purpose there yeah. is, is, is patience, right? It's, we're, not doing it, we're not doing it for regulatory reasons. Um, we're doing it because we really believe that um, we want to have those safeguards in place for people. Okay. So Ken, now I have the, the right Ken. T can you talk a little bit about how over the years you've seen technology change that helps drive what you do? That's a it's a really good question. It, you know, when I was talking about my background in graduate school, I worked with PCR, mm -hmm. and at the time, really PCR. This was what mid '90s. It was really the reason I was doing it was to amplify large amounts of DNA to be able to do sequencing. But to see how that technology has advanced to be able to do things, you know, for example, viral detection, to be able to detect different viruses mm -hmm. that might be there in the uh, material. That's one area, but also, you know, seeing some of the, the cool mass spectrometry, I think is the other one that I've just seen really yeah. develop over time. Uh, it's probably when I started here 10 years ago, they have the idea of mass spectrometry being used in a quality control lab where it's usually a routine mm -hmm. test that's being done. Is unheard of, and now you're starting to hear presentations where they're starting to talk about having mass spectrometers in you know, a commercial QC lab, and to see that technology come along so quickly uh, is pretty amazing. How about you, uh, Matt? Yeah, certainly, <laughs> certainly, uh, you know, technology changes. Uh, you know, in the purification world, there there is evolution, right? Yeah. So we start with, uh, you know. Uh, uh, well, chromatography has been around for a while, uh, sure. but but we do see advances. So we're able to, as we get these more complicated molecules that that that, that really they don't exist in nature. Um, they're they're engineered, right? They they're they're constructed. They um, and as much as possible, we try to make them stable and soluble. Um, they do they do kind of come sometimes with a little bit of burden. Um, we do see technologies that allow us to sort of deal with those. And so innovative ideas of new types of chromatography gels or new approaches for doing things to be able to, to handle it. You know, a big one is, is just productivity. So, uh, you know, uh, when I first started at MedImmune, um, we, our cell culture would produce, uh, you know, sub gram per liter. Uh, so you would need large, large volumes in order to be able to get drugs to patients and, and through advances in our cell culture group. Um, we're able to, to get those volumes down so that we can treat more people uh, more efficiently, more quickly. Mm -hmm. So those sorts of advances are really important. Okay, how about you, Nicole? What have you seen? Well, I think especially the uh, starting my, when I was doing my PhD, I worked with antibody expression and we isolated uh, the antibody gene sequences out of mm -hmm. human blood. And I know this was like an incredibly long process. Mm. And it got to the point where I was expressing fabs and that's like the best we could do. And we had different mutagenized and it took basically my PhD to get these fabs and to distinguish which residues were important. Now the antibody engineering group here is doing full length IgG expression, parsimonious mutation, uh, you know, 10 to the whatever mutants per to optimize an antibody and it goes incredibly quickly. So I think that process has really come along and the um, human B cell technology as well as coming yeah. along in general. I think that's really a key step forward. How about you, Wade? So, so I think over the years, uh, what, I've, what I've been struck by is the, uh, the uh, screening technologies mm -hmm. and the advancement and the miniaturization of, miniaturization of that. 
Um, and along with that, some of the imaging technologies that enable you to screen, you know, these high content screening image, imaging technologies that allow you to truly screen pathways rather than just single, single events right. in cells. So I think that that's, you know, the evolution of that in this, in this industry has been pretty remarkable. Yeah. I always like to tell people as a postdoc, I sequenced the polio genome. It took me a year. <laughs> a year. I could do it in an hour now, right? Yeah, the year of my life, but I didn't waste it because I interacted with people. Technology is just amazing in science. The thing about it is it's kind of random. You don't, people develop things and then they get applied, right? right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think even if I go to something more specific, like I mentioned, I, I used to work for this company, Biocore. And when I worked yep. there in the late 90s, they sold this, basically it was a big box that would allow you to do binding technology. And over just the course of 15 years, it's amazing what that technology, surface plasma and resonance, how it's advanced. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to do higher throughput kind of to allow more of screen, a screening mode. Different companies have started to evolve. You have companies like Forte Bio that are out there now that allow yeah. you to do 96 well plates to give you much more rapid measurements. It, it's just, just seeing even a specific technology like that, how it has advanced and it's really all about getting results more quickly to allow us to be able to get those drugs to the patients. So when things like this develop, how do you take advantage of them? So one of you notes something or someone else says, can you, can you readily adopt something new? Is that easy to do? Because I can tell you in an academic lab, as you remember, getting new stuff is hard. Well, yeah, I mean, we're always looking for new technologies. Yeah. And so we probably have a little bit bigger budget sometimes. A lot than, bigger budget. Than the academic labs. But yeah. Because it's, it's core to what we do, uh, yeah. you know, to, to move things faster, to, to dig deeper into the, into the science, to look deeper into finding molecules that, that we can progress. So it's, it's, it's core uh, in terms of the science that we right. do. Yeah, one, of the, one of the things we have in development, we have a group, it's called the Sciences, Science and Collaboration Steering Committee, and it's made up of the different functional groups within development. And what we're always looking at is what new technologies are out there a lot of times it's based on collaborations we have mm -hmm. with academics uh, where they're maybe involved in some of the leading edge technology. We work with them and bring those technologies into our company to right. you know, develop them further. So I wanna explore an, an idea about um, management. So you know, in academics, we, we come out of your postdoc, you go in a lab, you have no idea how to handle people. But obviously in industry, it's, it's a little more serious. You have to work with a wide range of skills and be productive. So how, how do you acquire these skills? Wade, we'll start with you. Sure. So, so I think that there are perhaps some similarities in one sense, in the, in the sense of scientific development, managing scientific development. So mm -hmm. that, that happens in academic labs as well. Uh, but I think the other side of it, as you point out, um, is that we're, you know, in industry, you're focused on managing toward, uh, allow, you know, enabling people to effectively interact mm -hmm. and, and function in an industrial environment. Uh, and, so, and so, yeah, I think coming in to industry in your first job, you, you don't have a lot of management experience. Um, but there's a lot of management training available. Uh, and so I think you've, the two ways that, that we do it in industry, it, and it varies per company, but there's, there's management training and then there's mentorship with good managers. Um, and so I think that, and it's, and it's also something that, that, uh, that, we, that we focus on, because you're right, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to, to enable your scientists to, to really, uh, you know, the career development, but also to, to be productive in this, in this setting. The way I view it in academics is everyone's gonna leave eventually, so you don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they go somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but here they tend to stay longer because you, yeah. it's a career rather than a training step as right. the way I view it. Personally, I kind of like that. I like when people go that way, if there's a problem, they're, turn out. They're gone, right? it's temporary. <laughs> But so if you went back to an academic lab, you think you'd be really good at running one now because of these acquired skills? Well, I, I, think, I, uh, I think maybe the people might be a little happier with, with me <laughs> than, than you, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 you know, so I think it's, it, it, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I think management training would, would benefit, you know, uh, would benefit academic mm -hmm. labs in some respects. I think perhaps the, some of the skills that we need here, you probably don't need there, but some of them you do mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a, you know, really running a productive lab. Right. Unfortunately, with the shrinking NIH budgets, that's never going to happen. We're never going to be trained to manage, so it will be haphazard as it... But you, you came out of an academic lab, and you could learn, right? So it's yeah. fine. Yeah, it's, if I can learn, just about anything. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Nicole, about this management idea? Um, I think 
like Wade said, we do have uh, the luxury of having some courses here yeah. that we can take, which is uh, nice. I think it's also, you know, identifying, which you can do in academics too, identifying people who you view as doing it very well and try to emulate that or ask for advice on how they manage and some tips that you can do mm -hmm. and just trying to feel it out. I mean, I think I've uh, now started managing people and it's, it's a learning process, you know? Um, and I think having good mentorship in order for somebody to say, you know, you really handled that poorly or you handled that quite well, I think that, that helps you learn along the way, which you can also do in, in an academic setting as well. Nobody tells you what to do or how you're behaving in academic. No one above you anyway. Your chair wow. typically doesn't yeah, say Yeah, that's anything. true, that's true. Really, I guess it's more peer level. The people right? who complain are in your lab, or, and they may not if they're not feeling bold enough to complain, where they should, because I think that would be important, but not every PI is receptive, as you know. Well, but I think, if I can just add yeah. one thing, I mean, you know, if you're a manager in industry, uh, you know, a certain percentage of your performance is based on how you manage. Right. Right, so there's a, you know, so, you know, you're, there's an incentive yeah. to do it yeah. well. I mean, I think in, in academics, what matters is your output, right? And, and either in personnel or in papers. So if you're managing properly, that will work. And if you're right. not, it's going to fail. And so it's sort of, it, as you said, it's sort Secondary. of similar. Matt, what do you think? Well, uh, one thing I'd say is uh, um, it, it, the way we're set up, we're highly collaborative. So yeah. you, you talked about interacting with people. That's, that's absolutely essential for us to do what we do. So yeah. whenever there's that sort of people component, whether there's, there's managing direct report people, but then there's influencing. There's, yeah. there's influencing people who are in other functions. There's influencing your boss. There's influencing people all around you. So, so um, I think we, we do, for lack of a better word, we screen. We are looking for people who are people people, yeah. like people science people, that, that communication don't, scientists who are good at English, writing, uh, communicating, those are really important factors. And so those, those abilities of, of managing just a one-on-one -on -one kind of mm -hmm. a communication mm -hmm. or a one-on multiple group communication, th those are the skills that are gonna help maybe establish you as a good manager. Because right. whether it's direct, direct reports or peers, you know, those are the skills that you look to. And, and in addition to the sort of the training, a lot of it comes through, uh, through just observation. You know, even as kids, we emulate our parents. We're looking to see what our parents do. You know, as, as a student in, in a graduate program, you, you have your, your advisor. You see other people's advisors. You kind of get an, an idea of, well, if I were going to be an advisor, what kind of uh, advisor would I be? And you start, you start just sort of emulating and picking those sort of traits yeah. from a management perspective that, that makes sense to you. I find that very appealing about industry, that you're all in it to work together and therefore collaboration should be mm -hmm. more fluid. And my wife who's been in, in, in industry for ages, uh, brings that home all the time. And I've always been jealous of that because it's very hard to get in academics to get other people interested yeah. mm -hmm. in what you're doing to collaborate with mm -hmm. them. It's something I've always regretted and wished could be better. Yeah, we talked about meetings. Yeah. I'm going to sound like I'm spinning it, but they're not, they're not, they're not meetings, right? They're re they really are collaboration discussions. No, like sure. we get together because yeah. we have yeah. a common goal or multiple goals. We have, we have a challenge that we want to work through it. We come together as scientists and, and, and engineers or operations or whatever, and, and we, we address it. So, uh, yeah. Ken, so you have any, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think everybody sorry, kind of touched on the keys. The, the collaboration aspect is really important. Also, in my, my daily job, I don't have direct reports, but or people that report directly to me, but a lot of what I need to have happen has to be done by influencing others, like Matt said. And it really, it does come down to communication and being able to connect with people and you know, kind of working together on these, these problems. Um, I, as far as the mentorship side, there are, you know, we have the training courses. We, we do have more formal uh, mentoring programs within analytical in our department. The CMC reps, we have what are called associate reps, and they're junior people that have expressed an interest in maybe becoming more involved in CMC activities. And they work with the analytical reps and they start to attend the CMC team meetings. They, you know, get involved in those activities and it's kind of a way for them to work alongside an analytical rep, see what goes on in these meetings and you know really learn about what the what the job's about in some cases 
after a while they might go, you know, you know what, maybe I didn't really want to be an yeah. analytical rep, but they've had that opportunity to kind of expand their skill sets. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to explore, what, what, is, what do academic laboratories mean to, to a company? Is it irrelevant? Do you work with them? Do you kind of have a casual interest? Where does no, it they mean a great deal, yeah. right? Because if you, if you think about the, the amount of science that can go on in any one company, no matter how big that company is, the majority of it's going on outside and probably in academic labs. Mm -hmm. So we collaborate qu quite, quite a bit. Um, and uh, you know, so we have formal collaborations and, and then we interact with the, scientific, with the academic communities as much as possible. So I think it's very important. Would you go back to academics? Do you have any desire to? Me, personally? Yeah. No. Okay. I'm not I mean, I, I just for me, you know, I've, you I'm very to. comfortable in, in okay. industry. Yeah. So what does academic uh, mean to you? Is it of, of any relevance to what you do? Um, yeah, so we, we do have uh, some pretty big academic interactions, collaborations. I think also a thing that I didn't really appreciate until I came to a company is we have a lot of invited speakers come and a lot of people like yourself just to give um, like seminars and to talk through projects and just to bring in their science as well, which I think helps us not just get so focused on our own thing, but kind of open up as well as meetings, uh, going to meetings helps as well. So I think there is key academic collaborations that we go after, but then also, you know, just uh, some more people that are doing interesting things in the field. Mm -hmm. We do have them come in and give seminars and, and kind of learn about that science. So if you were offered an academic position, would you consider it? Probably not. <laughs> And probably for very different reasons. Um, I think I'm a little bit schizophrenic with what I like in science, and I like to change things up after a while. So I actually enjoy working on different projects and getting to change fields and kind of learn new things about that field. And I think as an academic, I would probably uh, not get as much opportunity to, to change my focus as much. That was actually something I wanted to ask you as well. Um, Maybe, Matt, you could, do you feel you're restricted because you have to do what you need to do to make a drug and not just explore everything, like I can work on anything that I want to? Does that restrict you or it doesn't bother you at all? Uh, the way I would answer that, well, uh, you know, there, there are budgetary restrictions, right? There, yeah. are, there, are, there are resource restrictions, um, but um, there, there's never uh, a dull moment. There's, there's plenty of challenges, and I do, I do, I'm a doer, um, so I, I can see all sorts of, oh, look at all those fun, cool things mm -hmm. I could be working on. I do have the ability to, to pick the ones I want to work on, those challenges that I want to do, in addition to the ones I have to do. So, no, I mean, I think it's sort of a, sort of a science cafeteria. You know, there's a lot of different things that are kind of going on, and you can touch into those and, and do, the, do, do those different parts. Mm -hmm. And then, again, through external collaboration, that just opens it up, right? So the ability to connect to someone in, in an academic institution or an or a, or industrial partnership, you know, those are places where you can go beyond and outside and, and, and do those as well. There's, it's not discouraged. It's actually greatly encouraged to be able to do that. Yeah, that's something that, you know, MetaMune just over the last year or so, we've set up partnerships with Johns Hopkins University here, uh, the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. you know, we have collaborations going with them. Uh, we have a site over in Cambridge in the UK. They have a, uh, significant collaborations going on with Cambridge University. And to me, that's where there is an opportunity for us to explore some, some of those kind of, not maybe call them blue sky opportunities or look at some of the cutting edge approaches and working with those groups, it's a way to do it. So I, you know, I think a lot of companies really seek out those academic collaborations. And you know, we have advisory boards where we'll bring in key opinion leaders from you know, the different uh, therapeutic areas and mm -hmm. get, you know, kind of pick their brain on some of the work that we're doing and hear from them what might be happening out there in basic science. So if you, if you came in one day and had an idea which was related to the overall goal of the company, would you think about pitching it and trying to get support for it, or was that nothing you'd ever think of doing? I think that that's highly encouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had something taking place er earlier today. Yeah. It was called Shark Tank, <laughs> and it was a, it was an idea. It was a way for metamune uh, scientists to, you know, if they had something, some crazy innovative idea, to be able to present that to the the leadership team here and. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it, it's really encouraged for people to kind of come up with off the wall novel ideas. Uh, and so, yeah, I think if I had something like that, I would feel comfortable presenting that to, you know, the people within my organization or even to, you know, across the organization. You know, Google, Google employees get like 20% of their time to do whatever they want. You don't have that here, right? We do not have that, although I think we've talked about that. <laughs> Where, where's Mahisha? <laughs> yeah, maybe not 20% of your metamune time, but 20% of your 24-hour time. Yeah, you can, <laughs> at night you can think of whatever you want. Right? You get really good ideas when you're you know, like washing my hair in the morning. Okay, you're, like, shower, yeah, right? you know, you're always thinking. What so. hair? What? I'm sorry? Aww. I have hair back here. I just don't use as much. I'm very sensitive, too. Don't, don't worry. I don't use as much. Yeah. <coughs> I, I so, it takes me a while to get through. <laughs> The, um, there are a lot of people listening, as I said, who are thinking about a career in, in this area, in industry. So let's go through, and you, each of you can give them advice. What should they be doing in high school, college, and graduate school, say? Well, yeah, so high school. Um, I get a lot of high schoolers writing us, and they want to really? know how to get in the field. Well, I mean, if, if, if you love science, then you should start, start in high school, right? So you, and probably, uh, uh, you know, finding out what what part of biology or chemistry or what discipline you mm -hmm. really, really enjoy, um, and then focus in that direction as you go through college and then graduate school. And you know, I would also encourage folks, at least in biology, to do a postdoc, whether it's academic or in industrial postdoc. I think it's important that part of your training mm -hmm. um, helps you in the long run, I think, in industry. Is there any specific area that is better than any other? It's a therapeutic or? area? Or? Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Oncology? <laughs> No, I, infectious disease. It depends on what you love. So my, so my passion is, is infectious diseases. And so, it, so I will do that as long as I can in this business. Um, so I think it's, it's what your passion is, mm. right? Uh, because, you know, in terms of the best area to work in, that changes over time. So I get uh, a lot of local high school students who want to work in my lab for the summer. Is that a good idea to get started? Yeah, no, absolutely. Even though it's my lab, you know? It's, yeah, I'm yeah, not you're, you're not going to nice pay guy. attention to them. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, I think, I think uh, you know, the more lab experience, the earlier you can get, the better. Nicole, what do you think? I, I would concur for most of the things. I mean, I think uh, when you're in high school, if you enjoy science, you know, go to it. Take as much as you can. Um, learn what you like. And then in college as well. I, I think it's also good to not just focus just on science, though, too. I think, you know, uh, learning, going to the English, getting your communication skills, all these other more softer science things, I think, really come together, especially when you're working in a collaborative environment where you're working with a lot of different people. Um, and then I also, I mean, clearly I did a postdoc. I, I, I would encourage that as well. I think you grow in your independence, the more different projects and the more environments you're in, and challenge yourself to things that are, um, I mean, I don't think you have to do just translational research either. I mean, you can do some basic research as well, um, but having a thought of what you're interested in and what you're passionate about always makes you more excited to come to work every day, which is gonna make you get through that PhD program much easier. Um, so if you are not passionate about the science, then it's not gonna be worth getting up in the morning and going in. I mean, there is no perfect lab, no perfect. Except mine. Well, of course. <laughs> Subnote, except for yours. <laughs> Um, there's uh, very few perfect labs. How about that? And we don't all Berks, have the Berks, Berks, Berks. yes. We don't all have the opportunity to do that. But if you enjoy what you do, you're always going to enjoy coming sure. to work. And even getting negative results versus positive results, they'll even out at the end. Matt, what do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to reemphasize some things that have already been said. Getting in, getting into the lab early is a really good idea, and trying different things. So. Um, you know, as a high school student, you know your your options are a little bit more limited. Take those lab classes for sure. Talk to talk to people, your science teachers. Get a, get an idea of what kind of careers are. Talk to people like us. Whenever you're out, high school students, talk to people who are scientists. If you have friends whose parents are scientists, I think go out and talk to them and kind of figure out what what do they do. What is their average day like? When you get to college, um, then then you 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 have labs more available to you. You have a lot more flexibility. So um, customize your career. 
Um, try new things. Don't just think right away that you're going to try one thing. Don't, don't just get an internship position in an industry. Maybe also look at doing some um, undergraduate academic research as well. That way you get, you, not only do you make yourself a better candidate for going to graduate school and be better prepared for that, but you're starting your, your journey towards, uh, towards postgraduate scientist. And then in graduate school, again, you know, uh, make sure you look at a lot of different schools, talk to a lot of different faculty, do a lot of homework to find those ones where, where you're going to, when, when, I, when, when I was looking for graduate schools, I, I picked one that had multiple opportunities. I wasn't, I didn't just key in on one lab. I, I went to a school where there were like three or four labs that all had really interesting stuff that I would like to work on and, so that, that I could maximize my opportunity of, of hitting something that I wanted to do. So, you know, keep your options open, I think. And then again, you know, the, um, scientists have to communicate. Um, if you're in the lab and you have a really great idea, it, it's, that's good, but you want to share it with the world, right? So you're going to want to share it through the world through papers, presentations, talking to people. So those are important skills to develop as well. So even if you're like a high school student and you, you want to take all those AP chemistry classes and AP biology, think about your, bi your English class too. You know, concentrate on your writing skills too. Ken, is there any value in doing a summer internship in a company or is that not needed? I think that it's definitely something that high school students should look at. You know, if there's local science fairs, participate in those. Uh, a lot of times the people that participate in those science fairs, if they win, they catch the eye of companies like mm. Metamune and they'll be invited in to become an intern while they're in high school. We've, in the years that I've been here, we've had a number of high school students do summer internships. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity. And then just what everybody else was saying, you know, when I was thinking back to graduate school and being in the department I was in, where it was a general biological sciences department, I had the opportunity to do rotations before I picked the lab that I went in, even though I knew which lab I wanted to go into, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to do cell biology. So I got to, uh, you know, split cells, got to learn how to use a flow, flow cytometer. I then went to another lab where they were purifying kinesin from brain extracts, bovine brain extracts. And it was just having that opportunity to kind of dabble in each of the areas and see what research was going on in the different labs. That was a great opportunity. So I think it's a good idea not to narrow your choices early. And I, I like that I was thinking about the innovation and it, it's good to be well-rounded and learn about different things other than just necessarily science. Uh, one sure. thing that pops to mind is the whole history of Velcro. And I don't know if this is just an urban myth or not, but if you go out to like Arizona and you get those, uh, the cactus that break off and they have the barbs on them, that was really the inspiration for Velcro <laughs> was that whole concept. You know, the, they used to use that as a weapon, but the, the barb on that inspired somebody to come up with Velcro. Right. But you wouldn't even think about that. You know, you're out there in the desert looking at cacti, and, and here comes an idea that sure. revolutionizes. Have you ever uh, visited testing. a dental floss farm? What's that? <coughs> Have you ever visited a dental floss farm? A dental floss farm? Yeah, they grow it on farms. You know, that was that's what inspired. Now it's synthetic, of course. Oh, okay. No. I... <laughs> All right. One more question. If you weren't going to be a scientist, what else would you be, Wade? Yeah. So I got in trouble when I answered this before. <laughs> <laughs> I so, won't get you in trouble, don't worry. Yeah. Sorry. So I'll give you my other answer, actually. No. So I would probably open a surf shop. Surf Southern, shop? Southern yeah. California, yeah. You like surfing? Oh, yeah. It's a little hard to do it here. Okay. But. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I have a listener who is a retired biochemist in Southern California. He says he can surf and then drive to the mountains and ski in the same day. That's right. That's why it's a great nice. place. Nicole, what would you be? Um, I... If I could do anything, and I don't think this is a very lucrative job, but I would like to work for like Entertainment Weekly and review television shows. I love TV. Really? Yes. It's not a very scientific uh, okay. endeavor, it's, but it's not a I, I, I like to uh, watch different TVs and listen to podcasts and <laughs> read about them on, in magazines. <laughs> okay. so. Well, you can yeah. listen to podcasts now. <laughs> Matt, what would you do? If I had the talent and, and, and the luck, I would be something like a very creative, um, uh, I'm a huge Disney fan, so I'll go there. Uh, I'd be like in Disney Imagineering, like cool. in the creative process of, of designing attractions or that kind of thing. That would be very, because being, being surrounded by very smart, creative people all the time is, 
it's, it's what I am able to do here in the, in, in the language of science, but to be able to do that in a different kind of language would be a lot of fun. You know, uh, we, I was at Epcot recently with my family, and Bill Nye, the science guy, is sometimes there. So I said to my kids, I want to have a studio and do podcasts and have people come in, and, and the kids said, Dad, no one will come. <laughs> <laughs> I've often wondered what it would be like the world of purification at Epcot. And, like, <laughs> writing for the yeah. Yeah. But I, again, it'd be a limited. You know, the line would be really short. They used to have, <laughs> they used to have a double helix. Yeah, and no, it, was it wasn't double. Yeah, it was, it was quadruple wrong, yeah. helix. <laughs> you bothered guys all the heck out of that me. too. Yeah. Yeah. Bothered the heck out of yes, me. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, what would you do? Um, I love history. I would probably, if I if I won the lotto, I would. Well, no, I'd stay at Metamune. <laughs> but I'd also I'd also be a uh, I'd probably be a battlefield guide. I'd go up to Gettysburg or out to Antietam, and I'd say, Hey, do you guys need anybody to just be a park ranger? be a great opportunity to be outside in the outdoors, share my love for history with other people, and uh, I, I could enjoy that. I, I like the hats, the, the funky hats. That yeah, they, no, that'd park be, I could see and that. The, the very styling hat. shorts I could that see they that. If you did it in different languages, then you could bring the tourists around. Like, do you, do you speak a foreign language? I learned Spanish many, many years ago, yeah. but I would not, it would be the worst investment if somebody paid me to give them a battlefield tour in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, when I go to Europe and people give you a tour in your language. I think this is great, and the, yeah. the history mm -hmm. is great, and they're telling, so if you could be passionate about your own country's history mm -hmm. in another language, this would be cool. All right, thanks guys. I wanna thank you all for joining me. Wade Blair, thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate for doing this. Nicole, Nicole Cayuard Lillet, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> thank Did you. Did I mess up your name? Uh -huh. My name gets messed up all the time. It's Cal Award. Well, Cal right. Award. But it's close. I mean, it's really, really Isn't long. Isn't K A L L E a word for street in a, in a language, right? Yeah. German? Spanish. Spanish? Mm -hmm. C A L L E, right? Yeah, C A L L E. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Well, I thank you. I appreciate it. Matt Dixon, thank you so much. Sorry I called you Ken. That's fine. <laughs> Ken's a good guy. I don't mind it. I consider it a compliment. I'll give you money. Later. Ken Miller, thank you. Thanks for inviting me to begin with. I appreciate Thanks, it. It's Thanks to the audience for listening. And you've been listening to uh, This Week in Virology. You can find this show and all the others at twiv.tv and also at iTunes. And if you like what we do, we ask you to go over to iTunes, subscribe to the show. It's free. And leave a rating. You could leave some stars or a comment. That helps to keep it very high up there on the Apple iTunes directory so people can find us. And we do usually read questions on our episodes. And if you have any, send them to twiv at twiv.tv. If you have any questions about industry, send them. We'll, we'll get these guys to answer them. Now we have a connection. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>